You're late. You're supposed to be here at sunrise. When this mill is not working, we're losing money. This is a time clock. This is where you check in every day. You check in in the morning, you check out at night. That lets me know how long you were here and I can calculate your pay. I am J.P. Morin. I own this mill. And now that you've decided to work here, I own you too. We are behind in production. We are making socks for soldiers who are fighting in the First World War in Europe. And we're behind schedule. Those men need a lot of socks. This is a hosiery mill. As I said, we make socks. You're going to learn all the steps involved in making socks because we have a lot of them to make. Look at your name tag. You'll notice that your name looks a little strange. It's because it's French. Because the workers in this mill came from Quebec, French-speaking Canada. So most of them have French names and most of them all speak French here in the mill. Look at your name tag again. You're going to notice that there's a job there. That's the job you're assigned to. But because this is your first day in the mill, I want you to understand all the steps in making a sock. So you're going to go on a tour with one of the supervisors who's going to show you each and every step so that you'll understand what we do here. Melodia Champagne. Oh, there you are. Melodia, I noticed you're a looper. Your mother was a looper. She was an excellent looper. She had great skills. I hope you work as hard as she did. Alphonse Dupont, where are you? I see you're a turner boy. That's the lowest paying job in the mill. But don't get discouraged. I have a lot of workers here who were Turner boys when they started, and I promoted them, and now they're excellent workers and supervisors. I don't want to catch you goofing off. So now that you've heard from me, you're going to take the tour of the mill to find out what happens here and how we make socks. Good morning. I'm Delilah Champagne. I'm a finisher. But Mr. Morin sent me down here today so that I could sh show you why all these mills were built by this body of water. Now, you all know what this is. This is a river. It's the Winnipesaukee River, and it's very special because it comes from Lake Winnipesaukee. And you know what makes it so special? Let me show you the picture. Here is New Hampshire. And here is where we are standing right there. There's the river and there's the lake. But this lake is very special because it's part of the watershed from these mountains that are surrounding it. Ossipee, Belknap, and Sandwich Domes. And it's a watershed because water doesn't just come from rain to fill it because we live in the granite state. And the granite is very special because it's a rock that cracks a lot. So you know what happens up in these mountains in the winter? They have tons of snow. But when the snow melts, some of it evaporates, but a lot of it melts and goes into the rocks and they find a place down underneath that's like another little river. So what happens is when they finally come down in these little rivers underground, they come to the first big open space, which is Lake Winnipesaukee. And therefore, there are springs that pop, pop up and the springs feed the, this lake. So even if it's a very hot summer, this lake never dries up. Now, if you lived out west in the Rio Grande River, that becomes nothing but mud. That never happens. So not only do we have the Winnipesaukee River, now we have 20 mills right around Laconia, 50 mills all the way from here, and many, many, many more as it joined the Pemigewasset River, and then the, and the Winnipesaukee make the Merrimack River, which goes through Manchester. I'm sure many of you have seen the mills around the the Merrimack River when you're on the road and then it goes into Massachusetts and Lowell 
and those mills are as famous also as historical and then it goes to Newburyport and out into the Atlantic Ocean. So we are in a watershed because it's the water saved here but because the water is always flowing and it's flowing downhill so if you think about that it gives it more speed which is what the mills needed and the reason they needed it is because they use that for the water power. We're standing by this river. Water is very calm. But you notice that there's something that's cement there. And you look at the sign, it says danger. Because in 1790, there was nothing there but water going over. And that's a waterfall. There's a, a breach there, as you notice. And the water was falling. And there was no way to control it, but they had a water wheel. And at old, the first mills were had to be built by the water, so where it fell over, the water would come, do you see it? Turn the blades and make the wheel turn. So it had to be, the Bolsillo mill was the first one built here, so it had the water wheel right on it, and it turned, and it made, turned machines. The shaft went in and turned machines. Now, in 1790, the people realized they had to control that water because sometimes there would be a drought, so they built a dam. And that's why the danger sign is there. 1790, they built the Avery Dam, and um, it helped to control the water. But now let's get back to our problem. Our problem is, our mill isn't right here. Mr. Morin had to find a way to get the water into his mill to turn the water wheels. And you're gonna learn in the soon what happened to these water wheels? They weren't like this, they were like this. And I'm not going to talk about that now, but just so you can picture that. So what Mr. Morin did is he dug down on the bed of the river to start making a canal. He made his man-made river. They called it a sluiceway. And then they had to control how much water would go into his mill, into this smaller little river called a canal. And they built this system. And in the old days, there used to be a wooden gate and they had those gears up there. So the gears made it easier to pull up the wooden gate. And it became a metal gate, so it was, the gears were even more important. So that's how, and then if you looked over there, that tells how deep the water was, and they could watch. It looks like it's pretty low right now because we are in a dry season. All right, so now we're gonna walk around and I'm gonna have you look at clues as, so you can tell me where the canal went. Now you can see what this system works like and if you look down here it's all cement now but where I'm standing was in probably a deep water and I'm going to let you do a hypothesis I'm going to show you this picture right now this picture is taken right where I'm standing do you see this right there now look there on this building what do you see there that you see here you see an arch so one time that the bricks were not in between the arch and the water that was how the canal went underneath this river and that made it strong enough. Now, look at what you see in this picture. My, I want you to make a hypothesis of how deep was this canal. What do you see in there that you might know the height of? Well, I hope you'll say a man. So you see this is all clean and you'll know that the gates were down so no water was coming in so they could clean it. These are the machine fixers that were working to clean it. Now the gates are down and they're standing there picking up sticks and old fish and all sorts of things. How deep do you think it is from the base here up to the top of this? Look at the man. How many men about would be that up there? About two men. So that's what they, you have to guess. We don't know if they're five feet or six feet men. So it's either 10 to 12 feet is the depth of this water and it would be right there. Now we've walked to the other side of the mill, so tell me the clue you see. Yes, the arch. Now where you see the stones, I remember, how deep was that canal? It was about 10 feet deep. And the sides were there just like it used to be. And I'm standing, we're all standing in water. But it's a little cold to swim. Now look over here. Mr. Morin was very smart because he had to get the water in there. And it was a pretty wide canal. Look over there, what do you think he did? What do you see on the side of our, you see two arches, correct? Well, two arches, look at them. Look at the height of this one and the width. Look at the height of that one and the width. 
What he did is he dug down so that the water would go faster, just like on a hose. You put your thumb on a hose and what happens? The water splits and goes further and stronger. That's what happened here. Because he had two water wheels underneath there. And you'll learn about that the next stop, so I'm not gonna get into it, but just remember that. The two, and you'll see where they are inside. Now I'm gonna take you so you can really see the water going over the dam, and I'll show you one other thing, so follow me. See the dam was built in 1790, and to the right you can see it was repaired in 1949, and it might be getting fixed again because a lot of this is breaking. But that's what it looks like. Now you can see how the gates are halfway up, so the water isn't pouring over as fast, because probably right now, if you look over here, this is now the hydroelectric plant, which is where electricity is made today. And if you look over there in the water, you see how there's a, a whirlpool? That makes you know that the water wheel, it's not called a water wheel anymore, but it's called a turbine, is working. And then only one of them is working, so they didn't need as much power. So you see why they put the gate up? And the water wheel is turning and you can see the whirlpool. Notice how clear it is right here. Just notice the stones that you can see and the power that comes from having it be a dam and a waterfall. I just want you to notice this bridge. This bridge is what took the workers. This was called French Hill, and this is the boarding houses up there where all of our workers, many of them came from French Canada, from Quebec, and they spoke French, and they had a whole society of French people, French churches, French schools, French everything. So it was a very much of a separate but they worked hard and they worked in the mill and they would come running down here when that bell rang and the, hear the bell and they would check in to say it was time to go to work. So I want you to be sure to realize that up there, those apartments, some of them were there from the 1830s and 50s. We're standing in the middle of this building. This is the dye house. And of course, because we're by a mill where you made socks, the dye is of course the color. It's where they got the socks different colors here. And Mr. Moran would decide what color they need, and it was Christmas time and they were making red, but he wanted brown. So what did they do with the dye? They opened the window right here and they dumped it into the water. So what happened to the water? It became red. It would stay red five miles down the river, but it didn't just change the color. Everybody thought, oh, there's a lot of water, it's okay. But not only did it change the color, it killed the trees and it killed the fish. And that wasn't the only thing. People in those days had no place, so they would throw their bikes, they would throw old broken anything in there. And if you'd look up here, as you know, people were working there from seven sunrise until sunset. They had a place to go to the bathroom. If you look at that black part of the bridge, that was an opening, and there was a wooden outhouse outside. So obviously when they had to go to the bathroom, it would go down into the little canal that's underneath and go into the river. So not only did we have a dirty river, but we also had health problems. Another thing to look at this river, how beautiful it is right now, it's slow. 1963, when this mill closed, this was not able to be used, everything was polluted. But today, it took until the 1990s, 30 years to clean it up, and now it is used for recreation, fishing, kayaking, and it's wonderful. So I have one favor to ask of you all. Just remember, when you're using the New Hampshire rivers and lakes, keep them clean. And remember to use them for swimming and recreation, and that's all. Have a great day, and now it's time to learn about the motors and what happens in our wheelhouse. Bonjour. My name is Gideon Mayhew. My father-in-law is J.P. Morin, who owns this mill, and I hear that he owns you now. This is the powerhouse. This is the place where we turn the power from the river into the power that runs our hosiery machines and a lot of other things, including later on we make electricity. So originally, we used water wheels to generate the power necessary to run the machines. We have two different types. One is an undershot water wheel. One is called an overshot. The bottom line, the water hits these paddles and turns the wheel. The axle in the middle of the wheel is connected to the machinery that we use. 
these were the original ways that New England was built, whether it was sawmills, flour mills, and now manufacturing mills, including this hosiery mill. With the water wheels, is that when you have low water, they turn very slowly. And when you have a lot of water, they can turn so fast that they can actually break things. So the smart people in New England invented what's called a water turbine. And this is the way the Belknap Mills turbine looked. Water would come in here and turn the horizontal blades, and they're all connected, and we'll show you how all that works. And that's much more efficient. So this picture here shows uh, where the water, it's outside of the Belknap Mill, is entering the mill. And over here, you can see these t the penstock where the water comes into the turbines. So the bottom line is this area down here is where all the water is, and the turbines are down underneath. Wait, what? Is that an eel I see down there? Oh my god. I've got to get some people down there to clean those out. Those come up the Winnipesaukee River every year and then get stuck in these gears down here, and we have to shut the whole mill down. Who wants to volunteer to go down and clean those? When the water is rushing through here, and by the way, on out to the Winnipesaukee River, it starts to turn this turbine shaft. And all these gears then connect with this bevel gear, which is metal. So what happens if something jams this up? If these metal gears break, you're talking about days and days of downtime. So they thought of something very smart. These gears here, these are wood. They'll slip in here, and if this comes to a halt, then those will break off before these metal gears will. So the whole point of having these bevel gears is to transfer vertical power into horizontal power. And if you follow this down, you'll see that this room here actually had three turbines that were interconnected along this long drive shaft and down to those pulleys, which eventually we'll get to. So I want you to just put in your imagination and realize we are taking the water flowing under the mill, we're taking it off the Winnipesaukee River, through the mill, through these turbines that turn like this, and then turn it at right angles through this bevel gear onto this drive shaft. So this image shows the machine shop, and you can see these long belts. Belts are made out of uh, various, generally cowhide, that's been tanned and cut. And what you see here are the shafts, the rotating shafts, Eventually, if you follow those shafts and more belts, you would end up back down in this room where the river is delivering you mechanical power. So we see in this picture, it's hard, these faint lines. There's a shaft here, just like we saw in the machine shop, only what they're doing is they're coming down to the floor where you have another pulley, and that's running each of these hosiery knitting machines. And you can see in some of these other pictures uh, all the belts and pulleys. This is a good example right here. You can see these belts and pulleys. I got to tell you, this was a noisy, crazy place. Things were moving. You just had to really keep your wits about you. And if something broke, a, a you could get into a real tangle. So if they had a problem, they'd take a sock and put it on top of their machine so that they could come down the line and see that this machine needed fixing. So the big problem with mills during the 19th century was they created a lot of dust, which is very flammable. And the workers needed light to see, and that's why you see all the big windows in the mills. But then they began figuring out how to convert rotary power to electricity. And in 1918, Mr. Morin invested $12,677 
to bring electricity to the mill. In fact, it was so successful that he was able to sell excess power to the city of Laconia. This is the main control panel, and when they had too much power, then they could send it into the city of Laconia. Uh, otherwise, they would keep it here in the mill. The electricity is one thing, but we still have to get the power out of the river, and we do that through these bevel gears and these hydro turbines down there, but how do we regulate the flow of that? We have up here, we have a speed governor, and if you've ever seen a skater in the Olympics, and when they want to go fast, they bring their arm in, and when they want to go slow, they put their arm out. That's how a speed governor works. These go in and out, and that's important because we don't want the power on the other side to be constantly changing or they're going to have a lot of, you're going to have a lot of drop stitches in that machinery. It's important that the power that comes out uh, is absolutely steady. Here we are. This is one of the big drive wheels. But I want you to keep in mind that the way this wheel gets turning is through our hydro turbines, which take the power out of the river connect it through bevel gears to the shaft, the main shaft right here. And that's going to, then we're going to put belts on these and run them up through the mill, through holes and through every part of the mill there'll be those belts and shafts that you saw in those pictures down below. However, not only did we have belts directly driving machinery, but we also had belts once we electrified this running generators, electric generators, with, a, with the belts right off one of these main pulleys. These rotate iron cores in, a mag, in uh, coiled wires and that generates electricity. You can ask your physics teacher about that. These belts, sometimes they break and you can see how they have to be clamped together these things keep moving. If you're not careful, you could lose a finger. So thank you. You've learned how we change the water energy flowing by in the Winnipesaukee River into, through hydro turbines, into mechanical energy which rotates the shaft, which rotates these wheels, which connects the belts all the way up into the mill. And later on we connected them to electrical generators to actually convert water power into hydroelectric power. And with that, we entered the, rev the Industrial Revolution. Bonjour. Je m'appelle Lillian Bandreau. My name is Lillian Bandreau, and I'm a knitter. And Mr. Morin has asked me to explain to you new mill, mill workers um, a lot about the machines that you'll see in this room and some of the jobs that you're going to learn about later in the day. A new machine mixer is coming to the mill tomorrow as an apprentice. Now, the apprentice word comes from the French word apprendre, which means learner. So he is going to be supervised by an experienced machine uh, fixer. The apprentice will be taught by a master machine fixer on how to take care of these machines, take them apart, clean them, repair them, put them back together. And it's not an easy job. And that's why it will take him two or three years, probably, before he can become a master machine fixer himself. It's a very good job with very good pay. The machine fixer gets paid by the hour, not just like the supervisor. The rest of the workers get paid by the piece, that is by the socks that they handle, not by how long it takes. And they will not get paid for bad socks. In 2018, this room would have maybe 40 knitting machines all in rows, very close together. 
Can you imagine the noise that it would make? You could barely hear yourself think. As a knitter, you might have had one or two machines that you were supervising, but as you got better at it, you might work up to having eight or ten machines that you would be working, working on, which is very good for you because the more machines, the more socks you make, and the more money you will earn. Now, if one of your machines was broken down, you would have to call your machine fixer. However, it's so loud and noisy in here, they can't hear your voice. So we have a special signal that we use. We take a sock and we throw it over the top of the knitting machine. That way, the supervisors and the machine fixers can look across the room and notice which machines were having a problem and can fix them right away. Because a machine that's not running does not make socks and that doesn't make us any money. You may know about knitting or know somebody that knits a sock. They use two needles and they form a loop. Knitting is all about making loops. Well, in 1918, we were very lucky to have a machine made right here in Laconia from a company called Scott & Williams, and it made a knitting machine that looked just like this, and instead of one needle, the cylinder had 84 needles in it, in this big circle here. And it was able to make 84 loops at one time. Now, hand knitting, how long do you think it would take to make a sock this big if you were knitting by hand? Quite a long time. However, with our knitting machine, with the 84 needles, we can make a sock just like this in six minutes. Now, if you can make one sock in six minutes, how many could you make in an hour? Ten. That's two pairs right there, a lot faster than knitting by hand. As I explained to you earlier, our knitting machine has 84 needles in it, and they're latch needles. And I have a replica here to show you how it works. It has a little arm that comes up right over the top and forms the loop. There are 84 of these large needles in each machine going up and down and they make 84 loops in one circulation. Nowadays the knitting machines are run by computers, but back in 1918 we had a manual way to program the machines. And here's how it works. If you look at this chain on the bottom of the machine, it rotates through the machine and it has different spaces and different knobs all around it. And it literally tells the machine when a change needs to be made. For example, a change in color or a change in size. Now the knitting machine starts knitting the sock from the top. The first thing, rotation, it makes a, a, a welt or a fold at the top. And then as it goes down and changes color, as I explained to you on the programming chain, you'll hear a sound effect, click, click. And that tells the machine to change the uh, color of, of the yarn. So we go from green and we hear a click, click, and then it's red. It's green again, click, click, changes to red. Now we have a long section of one color. So then it just makes a humming sound for a long time. Hum, 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 hum. Now when we get down to the heel part, you'll hear the machine make a sound that goes bang, 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 bang. And that's because it's only rotating halfway around. At this point, when they're making the heel color, which you can see, it only rotates uh, in a half circle. So you'll hear that bang, bang until it does the heel. And then we get into that section again where we have hum, 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 all the way down to the toe, where it again does a half rotation because it doesn't have to go all the way around. I wanted to point out another thing for you on the uh, knitting machine. Up here is called a tension wire, and this keeps all the yarn very taut so that all the loops uh, are nice and tight. So now by now, if you look down here, you begin to see the sock forming in this little uh, cylindrical tube, and eventually it would come out the bottom, all done like that, and it would go to the loopers because a sock that comes off the knitting machine does not have a seam at the toe yet. That's a job for our loopers. Now we need a machine fixer in this room because there are so many things that can go wrong with these machines. Needles could break, the yarn could get twisted up or caught, then they would have to tie them back together with a very special knot. A belt can break and would need to be replaced. So lots of things can happen. That's why it's important that a machine fixer is close at hand. Now the supervisor is the one who has in, who's in charge of having all the supplies that the machine fixer would need to take care of these machines. The extra belts, the yarn, broken uh, uh, needles that need to be replaced would be, uh, the supervisor would have those on hand, um, and the machines would need to be lubricated. That's why we have our oil can.
One of the major problems we have with these machines are the dust and the fuzz balls that come from using uh, and working with the yarn. That's why the machines are required to be cleaned very uh, frequently. So it's very important that the machines are maintained carefully because a machine that's not running does not produce socks and that doesn't produce uh, money for our, our workers. The knitter, I only get paid for good socks, so before they go to the loopers, I have to check them very carefully to make sure that they're okay. Go. Now we only get paid for perfect socks, good socks only, so before the sock goes to the loopers, I as a knitter have to make sure that um, all the stitches are, are taut and tight. And uh... So now the sock needs to go to the loopers to have the seam closed, but before that can be done, the sock needs to be turned inside out so that the seam will be on the inside of the sock. And that's done by the Turner boys. This job, and here's how they do it. Here's the sock with the open toe that's not yet stitched. They go into the, all the way to the end. They pinch it with their fingers this way and pull it this way. So now it's inside out and is ready to go to the loopers. Now here is how the loopers would put the sock on the looping machine, which is this machine over here, and I'll explain more about that in a little bit. But these all have needles, and they simply push the yarn onto the needles all the way around like this. Now they're very careful not to stretch it like this because that would stitch a very uh, wide toe, and that would not be considered a good sock, so we wouldn't get paid for that sock. So very carefully, again, they put it on the needles like this with only about a half an inch on the top, and then I will explain how it gets stitched as this machine rotates it around. Now, being a looper is a very difficult job. It takes a long time uh, to learn how to do it. You have to have very good hand-eye coordination, and that's why loopers get paid more money for their, uh, for their skills. And sometimes a very good looper will be allowed to have a machine at home to do part-time work. That might be because a, a worker was married and then had to be home taking care of her family. Mr. Morin would let her have a machine at home to do some work. So looping was a very good job to have here at the mill. Now I'll explain how this looping machine works. I told you, told you about all the needles and how the looper puts the sock on the needle right here. Well, this is rotating in a circle and has three parts to it. When it gets to this part, it cuts off the extra material on the top. It continues to rotate around to this part where the needles go up and down and the seam is stitched together. And then it continues to rotate on this part where the uh, extra yarn is cut off, the threads. Now the looping machine is continuously rotating, so the loopers have to work very fast. However, if it gets going too fast, they have a pedal at the bottom, which is like a brake pedal. They can slow it down. Stitch, the seam is in place, the sock would be taken off the machine, and it would go to the turner voice again because now the sock has to be turned right side too. And I'll show you how they, they did that. We go right into the end. It's a little easier with a finished sock because you don't have to worry about it unraveling. And you simply pull it through again, so now the sock is right side out, and that goes to, uh, from here goes to the borders. Bonjour! Welcome to the finishing room of the Belknap Mill. My name is Alice Herbert, and I am a, a woman who lives on French Hill. I come to work every day at the mill. Um, and Mr. Moran asked me to tell you a little bit about the job of the border and the finisher. This is the finishing room, and we get a big uh, basket of socks from, from the borders. The borders also got a big basket of socks, and they, they take the socks and put them on a board. That's why they're called borders. Boards uh, may, made in the shape of a foot and a leg because we have to shape the socks so they fit on different people, different size shoes. So we get the the socks from the knitting machine and the Turner boys and the boarders take the socks and put them on a board carefully. They stretch it on so the toe is around the, the toe nice and smooth on either side and the heel fits nicely on the board and they pull it up. Because the socks need to be fit and almost shrunk uh, and the way that we fit them to the board is through steam. And we use steam to shape the wool or the cotton socks to a form. Water and the steam from that is coming through this pipe in th throughout all these lockers. And the border 
the border, the man, the job of the border is to take, put the sock on the board and five boards go into one locker and one man has 10 lockers he's in charge of. So he puts five socks in, goes to the next locker, puts in five down, and so he has 50 socks in there. When he's finished that, he comes right back to the first locker and takes out the socks and just puts them in a basket for me, for the finisher, to look at. So it's hot, steamy work. He, he can wear an undershirt while he's working. He doesn't have to be dressed up as some of the other workers do in the mill um, because it's hot and it's dangerous work. So only men are boarders. So the boarders have done their, their job. They've put the socks on the board, steamed them, taken them off the boards and put them in a basket. And it comes here back to the, to the finishing room. All the socks from the boarders and look at each one to make sure it's good to go. And I have to match them up color for color. So I get a good pair of socks. I take a, I just, pull them real quick from the basket and find two that would match. So at first I look at the sock, make sure this everything is good. That looks good. Yep, that looks good. And I'll put them together. And what I like to do is keep the pairs together and then go back and get them ready to, to go out. So take a look. Looks good on this side. This looks like a Christmas sock, red and green. Oh, but my trained eye, I've been doing this for a while, so I can see quickly there's something wrong with this sock and I don't know if you can see that it almost looks like it should be there it's a stripe but it means it's a run in the stocking and it means that one of the latch hooks on the machinery did not grab that loop as it went around in the machine it just never caught on so this sock is not good and, and it I'll just have to put it in the throwaway pile uh, it's too bad because it can't be fixed. And I only get paid by the piece. Getting paid by the piece means that you only get paid for the, the things that are good. And for a sock, it's a pair of socks. So it's two, two socks equals one piece. So I need to work hard and fast to make sure that I can see the socks and that they're good enough to go out. Just pull this sock out of the, the basket from the borders and it, right away I can see it's not good. The, I don't know what happened here. It, it could be any number of things. Sometimes those Turner boys are silly and they might have done something mischievous with the sock, or it could have been from a, a needle on the machine. Or another thing, from because it just came from the board, is one of those boards may have had splinters. It goes in and out of that steam chamber. It could have had splinters on it, or it just could have got snagged on something. Here's one, look, right away, oh, I see a little hole in it, but this is a small hole. And I always keep a needle and thread in my pocket. I will just fix that right up. I'll have some red thread and green thread and no one would know the difference. So I can, I can fix that. I match them up, two good socks. I already took a look at them. So I fold it in half at the heel. And then I kind of just pinch it just a little to make a little crease. And I put this sleeve on it. So it's facing up and kind of smooth out the sock and put it in the box ready to go out to a department store. Some of our customers um, buy our, our socks from a department store, but right now our main customer is uh, the U.S. Army. Uh, soldiers are wearing our socks and the, the Army, the federal government gave us uh, enough money to make a lot of socks so we haven't, uh, we know where to ship them because right now in Germany and France it is the Great War. It's the men are fighting in trenches and if you've seen a trench like on the side of the road it's it's kind of deep um, and but these trenches were dug specifically for men to fight so they were they had very deep trenches over the men's forehead and they dug right into the ground. And the men were, got this horrible disease. It was called trench foot. Um, trench foot is a disease where the, an infection sets in. in be, first starts in between the men's toes when their feet are wet. It's not, it's not pretty. Some men actually had to have their toes cut off and some even their whole foot because it was a horrible disease, trench foot. But then this year they figured out that it was because of the wet feet standing in the mud. And if the, if the soldiers had dry shoes and socks, they would not get trench foot. So our job is to be sure to 
that all the U.S. Army men have nice dry socks to wear. And they have one pair on their feet and another in their bag, so they can always take off their wet socks, dry them, and then have nice dry socks to put on. And trench foot has been eliminated when people figured out that that was the reason for it. It's an important part of this mill to have that job to supply socks to the men. Here we are right now. We're underneath the roof in these small little windows up here. And in the mill, this, the, these little windows and there was storage space in the roof under the windows. And um, it was just for storage. They didn't do a lot of uh, working up here in the fourth floor. But the other three floors were all part of the working mill. And you can see this is, this is the end of the mill and this is the side of it. Uh, it's a, all these windows, which I'm sure you noticed when you saw it, tall windows with lots of glass. And it's kind of the shape like of a, of a shoebox or a rectangle because um, in order for the light to get to the middle of the, of the building, we needed lots of windows and we didn't want a wide expanse, we needed a narrow expanse. So that's why mills are narrow and long to get as much light in as possible, all these windows here. This brick mill was built in 1823 before it it was built right on the same place there was a, a, a mill made of wood and it burnt down. But fire is still a concern because even though the outside is made of brick, we have wood floors, we have wood beams, um, and, and there's a fire hazard. The, the embers from the coal burning furnace can come up and land on the roof. And um, we're concerned about fire with all the lint and the, and the cotton fibers that are in, in the mill, it, it is a concern. There's always a bucket of water on each floor in case the fire starts. And if, if the, the embers come out of the chimney, sometimes Mr. Moran would ask one of the men, only a man, um, if we'd be interested in coming up through the bell tower up here, walk along the roof to a ladder and with the bucket of water and wet down the roof to make sure that no fires started. Women couldn't do that, and it had to be a strong man to do it, but uh, that was a, a job to consider. Speaking of the bell tower, this bell tower, and you probably, probably saw that in the picture too, we're so fortunate to have it. The bell itself was uh, forged by an apprentice of Paul Revere, and it rang in the morning to get people to work at sunrise, as Mr. Moran said. When the sun came up, that was time to go to work. The bell would ring, and people would know it would be time for work work. Bell rang again around noontime and it was time for lunch. Um, some of the workers could walk home for lunch and um, but they knew by the bell that it was it was lunchtime and then it rang again in the evening uh, when it was time to go home. Uh, and most of the mills had had bells but we're so fortunate to have this lovely bell here. Um, and the reason that people paid attention to the bell was because Nobody can afford watches. Only Mr. Morin or some of the supervisors might know what time it is. But the rest of us, the workers, we can't afford things like that. So we have to listen for the bell to know when it's time to start work and when it's time to get going home. Thank you so much for coming to see the mill today. I hope you enjoyed the tour. We are so lucky to have this building to, to uh, work in and to enjoy. So enjoy the tour and, and I wish you well. Au revoir. Okay, I will see you tomorrow at sunrise for your first day of work.